What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here, back again with the Odd Shopper channel. Today, we're talking some college basketball. It's day two of round one of March Madness, Friday slate. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We're also brought to you by Bet365. For those of you living in the states, Kentucky, Ohio, New Jersey, Virginia, Iowa, Colorado, Louisiana, Indiana, Arizona, and North Carolina, you have some free money coming your way. What you'll do is click the link in the video description below. Make your first deposit on Bet365 of at least $10. Turn that around $5 wager on any team, total market, whatever you want. Whether it wins or loses, you are getting $150 in the form of bonus bets. Who wouldn't want an extra $150 in the account as we move forward to March Madness? Must be 21 or older to play, 18 in Kentucky. If you or somebody you know has a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. This is a limited time offer, so make sure you take advantage of this as soon as you can. All right. Middle of the day on Thursday right now, so don't have all the results. We have a win with Duquesne, a loss with Mississippi State, and hopefully more wins to come. But first and foremost, we are going through every single game. There won't always be a definitive play for each game. Sometimes it's just a lean, and we'll talk about it. But I'll try to be very specific when that is happening and when we're actually making a play. With that said, let's dive into our first game. This is just in chronological order as well, not going like any other sort of ranking system with the games. Northwestern takes on FAU. This is a game with a slight spread in favor of FAU. You can find Northwesterns out there at three and a half has actually popped in the market, which is a bit surprising to me. Biggest story with Northwestern is they're not at full strength. They've lost Nicholson and Ty Berry. Neither are going to play in this game but they've actually played relatively well without these players down the stretch have lost some games, but it's all come down to single digits. They've lost three of their last four, but seven point game against Iowa four point game against Michigan state clobbered Minnesota. And then they lost to Wisconsin by nine in the big 10 tournament in the opening round, which wasn't ideal for them. We really just have every single statistical advantage working Northwestern's direction with the exception, I suppose of rebounding where Northwestern does seed a pretty decent advantage, 269 to 43, and losing Nicholson's not going to help that. But I still have a lot of questions with FAU. The body of work for this team has been questionable, to say the least. Have a number of premier wins and then just really concerning losses considering this AAC conference. So to dive into FAU's resume a little bit, you have a loss to Bryant, like an egregious nine-point loss in non-con. Wins over Butler, a and Virginia Tech, Charleston, a loss to Illinois. Then they beat Arizona in double OT. That looks better on paper than I think real life. And then just a slew of losses in conference play. They lose to Temple in the AAC tournament. Losses to Memphis, South Florida, UAB. Most of those teams not being tournament bound either. So it's a pretty concerning resume for FAU. You just look stylistically what these two teams do. FAU wins inside. That's definitely an advantage over Northwestern who is 177 in interior defense before losing some of their bigs. And then from three, you have a pretty decided advantage Northwestern's direction. They're fourth in three-point percentage. FAU is 155 defending that area of the floor. So there are advantages that work both directions. FAU inside Northwestern from the perimeter, but ultimately I do not trust the defense of FAU. And Northwestern plays extremely slow, 343. So the value of the points do make some sense here. Even with the injuries, I'm going to back Boo Booey, Langborg, and this Northwestern team in this first matchup. Next up, game I don't have a ton of interest in. It's Colgate taken on Baylor. This is a big spread. We'll just talk Colgate, I guess, first give you the low lowdown on this team. As far as Colgate goes, they won the Patriot League. They were the number one seed. They rank 143 in the country, according to advanced statistics. The only other team in this conference, I guess there's Three others in the top 200. Colgate's the only team in the top 100. Lehigh's 263, Bucknell 276, American 294, and Boston 295. Really weak Patriot League, and this team is 0-2 in quad one, 1-3, one quad two, 2-1 two in quad A. So what did they do? They've got a win over Vermont. Only team they have a win over in the field, Weber State is their next best win at 153. Losses to Syracuse, that was relatively close. Blown out by Yale. Lost by six to Harvard. That's not great. They didn't have Brady Cummings in that game, which is what it is. Blown out by Arizona. Blown out by Illinois. Blown out by Iona, who is 224. Blown out by Cornell. 
five point loss to Lafayette, who's 318, and then a loss to American, who's 294. This Colgate team is not the same we've seen in other tournaments. They are still predicated on shooting, but now you're facing a Baylor team that's going to shoot even better than you. So the effective field goal gap, Baylor 16, Colgate 54. Three point percentage, Baylor's fourth, Colgate is 76. The real issue for me is just defense on Colgate side. How do you stop Baylor with your three point shooters? How do you stop Yuve Misi inside? This Colgate team actually plays a pretty tall lineup, 47th, but Baylor's 21st overall. I think the best place to look honestly in this game rather than a side is just a total. Now, pacing's not going to line up here. You have two slow teams, especially on the, the Baylor side. 274 is actually a surprisingly slow pace for them. The both teams that are actually better on offense than you might think. Baylor, it's pretty evident in their number six offensive ranking. But Colgate, despite being 224, they still shoot the ball well. We mentioned their three-point percentage. They're 54th in effective field goal, so it's nearly a top 50 offense just in terms of raw shooting. Some of what they lack is on the boards. They're terrible offensive rebounding, some of that by design. Just play very disciplined defense rather than attack the glass. That's on the offensive end. So I think there is a chance this goes over just through the raw shooting on both teams. It's not like Baylor's defense scares you. They're 244 inside and 150 defending the three. So I think the best place to look is just a raw over here rather than a side. Next up, tough game. UAB takes on San Diego State. This is one that I find particularly difficult to handicap. UAB has to win the auto bid in their conference. San Diego State, obviously, Final Four last year. Even without winning the Mountain West, they were kind of a shoe in to get to this spot. These teams are built similarly, but B UAB just is awful on defense in comparison. So for reference, neither of these teams is particularly good at shooting. San Diego State comes in. They are 219th in effective field goal. UAB is 215th. Both these teams are decent inside. Yaxel Lendenberg for UAB and, of course, Jaden Ledee for San Diego State. But the real problem is this San Diego State defense is stifling and UAB can't score. Then on the other side, San Diego State has trouble scoring, but they're awesome offensive rebounding and rebounding in general, which neutralizes UAB. And then they're just so much better defensively. The only real weakness they have on defense comes inside, and I wouldn't even call it a weakness. They're 84th there compared to 20th from three. UAB is 173 in two-point percentage and 233 from three. So this isn't a game I particularly love. If you force me to pick one, it would be San Diego State. The body of work for these two teams has both been questionable. I think it's a little better on the San Diego State side. UAB has some pretty egregious losses to like Southern Miss, Arkansas State, Charlotte, Wichita State, Rice. San Diego State's body of work is cleaner. They still have a couple losses that are somewhat concerning. But, you know, even some of their lower ranked losses like UNLV, that's a good team, NIT team. Grand Canyon's in the field. So I trust the body of work more for San Diego State. Pacing's going to be slow, but it's a pretty greasy game with two bad shooting teams. It's largely going to be a pass unless you can find a better line on San Diego State, but not going to play UAB in this spot. Next up, fun one. Western Kentucky takes on Marquette. Injury game. Big story is Tyler Kolick. I think he's fine. He's been practicing. A lot being made of this, and there just isn't information. I don't know what to tell you. What I can say is if you had 100% Tyler Kolek, this line would be like 15 and a half or 16, just mathematically. So if you personally believe Tyler Kolek is 100%, no limitations, you should lay it on Marquette. Even without him, this team has played pretty well, and Marquette has seen a shooting regression positively during the season. And Western Kentucky has been a real disappointment. You look at the composition of this roster, full of power six transfers, tons of guys that wanted to come down and play with this program. I don't know what happened. Don McHenry, he's an awesome transfer. He's actually an up transfer from the JUCO level. Rodney Howard's from Georgia Tech. Newman's from Purdue. Dante Allen's from Kentucky. And you have players like Christian Lander from Indiana. And, I mean, it is what it is. This team is just disappointed considering how many transfers they have. They play extremely fast. And on offense, they've been pitiful. They're 111th in effective field goal, 103 in two-point percentage, 152nd from three. Marquette laps them everywhere. The biggest thing I think here is Western Kentucky's 270th in turnovers committed. Marquette plays that pressure defense. They're going to pressure you the, almost the whole game, 20th in turnovers forced. Honestly, this is just a Marquette or pass. I'm passing if I think Mark, Tyler Kolek is not healthy, but I know that he's been practicing for multiple days in weeks now. And I can just tell you in the back end, mathematically, Marquette is a larger favorite than 14 and a half if 
you have the information Tyler Kolek is 100%. Next up is Stetson taking on UConn. I did not, in yesterday's show, I kind of put like little spots where I think you could back teams that are massive favorites as like leans. I'm not even going to pick them here. The analysis on Stetson UConn, it's a name your score for UConn. They're 26 and a half point favorite. If you think they play their starters over half the game, or if you just flat out think that Stetson's starters couldn't even walk on at UConn, which is kind of what I think you should probably just lay the points to talk on Stetson briefly. This team is awful. They won the a sun. They're ranked two fourteenth in Ken Palm. They were the second seed in the a sun. I mean, the best team in this conference was actually Lipscomb at 166, then Eastern Kentucky at 210. Stetson was 214. So they were the third best team in this conference, just power ranking wise. No wins in, they were 1 and 3 in quad A, 0 and 1 in quad 2, 1 and 0 in quad 3. Best win is UCF. They won by three points on the road, which was pretty good. Then they beat Charlotte 114 and Lipscomb 166. Bunch of egregious losses. They have seven losses outside the top 250 which is horrific. UConn's the best team in the country. And again, I don't think any of Stetson's players could even walk on at UConn. So lay the points or pass. That's about as much analysis as we need. We'll talk about UConn more in future videos when they actually face a real opponent. Next up, New Mexico takes on Clemson. This is maybe the funnest game to talk about in the entire first round. Basically, New Mexico wins the Mountain West, a team that most considered needed to win to get an automatic bid. Otherwise, they're probably headed to either first four at NIT, but they do. They get it done. And now they're favored over six seed Clemson, New Mexico, the 11 seed here. They have the better statistical profile overall, but 23rd on defense, Clemson 68. Offense, Clemson has a slight edge. It's 27 to 39, but both these teams are tall. They're actually one spot apart at rebounding. And you look at the effect of height numbers, both teams play with a pretty good lineup in terms of height. Clemson's 34, New Mexico is 72. New Mexico has a little, you know, this kind of goes for both teams. Injuries have affected them. Clemson played most of the year without Jack Clark. New Mexico has played most of the, not most of the year, but multiple games missed from Jalen House, Jamal Mashburn. Games here and there from some of their ancillary players like Baker and Amzil. So we kind of have incomplete statistical profiles on both. But. It's going to be a tougher matchup for New Mexico. Clemson's awesome on the interior, 49th interior defense, 38th interior scoring. New Mexico's outside the top 122 in both those metrics. And then Clemson's just a better shooting team, 44 an effective field goal to New Mexico's 155. You could argue little meat left on the bone for New Mexico with all those guards being injured, but they don't shoot a lot of threes. They're 332 and three point rate. That's adjusted for pace, 203 and three point percentage. That's how you beat Clemson. You don't beat them by going up against Shiflin and PJ Hall in the interior. Actually showing value on the Clemson side at the plus two and a half, which is surprising considering Mashburn House and all the elite guard play this New Mexico team has. But Clemson, I mean, they've got the height to face New Mexico. It's a pretty underrated Clemson team considering what they've done. So two and a half is a number I like. I'm not willing to go beyond this. If it has to be one and a half or two, I'll be out on this because New Mexico is a pretty good team. In their own right. Next up, Yale takes on Auburn. I don't know. Not the funnest game, in my opinion. The Ivies are really hard to evaluate. They just don't play anybody all season long. They play limited games. They play those weekend back-to-backs. And it's kind of a nightmare to handicap because they only really play each other. Yale's best win this year. I don't know. It's outside of conference. It's probably Colgate. At 144, so it's definitely not a good schedule. They don't have any wins in the top 100. Plenty of losses. Lost to Weber State, Rhode Island, Vermont, Fairfield, Kansas. They got clobbered. The only time they really stepped up in competition. And we're pretty lucky to win this tournament. I mean, Brown upsets upsets Princeton, and then they face Brown and barely win by one. Now you're facing Auburn, who is battle-tested. They kind of squashed the concerns we had heading into the SEC tournament. Namely, this team couldn't win on the road. They finally found a way to win away from their own building. What I will say is they've not played the hardest schedule in the SEC, and they don't have a lot of high-quality wins. Actually, most of the time they've stepped up in competition, they've lost. So you just look at their good games. Lost to Baylor in the opener. Then next time they played a top-50 team, it was Texas A&M. They won, but that was at home. The teams they've played like in the top 40. So you had Baylor loss, Bama loss, Mississippi State loss, Alabama win, Florida loss, 
Kentucky lost, Tennessee lost, Mississippi State win. I don't know. Most of these are losses. So I think analytically, Ken Palm, Bartorovic, this team grades out really highly. Most of that comes from just absolutely beating the piss out of really bad teams. Like their SEC competition is so loaded to these games. They killed Arkansas and LSU and these bad teams that weren't even sniffing the tournament. And then when they play good teams, they're either hyper competitive, close wins, or just flat out losses. All this to say, I'm not buying Auburn long term. I think UConn rolls them in a potential matchup later in the tournament. But as far as this team matching up against Yale, you do really have everything to stop Yale. The better players for this Yale team, I think you're looking at Danny Wolf, the seven foot sophomore, and of course, Matt Noling, one of their elite guards. But you've got Janai Broom, the best player, I think, on the interior in the game. He sees a little bit of size, but. He's definitely more skilled, and he's much older than, than Matt Wolf. Jalen Williams on the inside, he's a senior. Chad Baker, Mazzara, those are the three best players for the Auburn team, all playing on the interior, neutralizing Wolf. Then you just have a slew of guards with Holloway, Katie Johnson, Denver Jones, and Trey Donaldson's actually played well, too. It's an Auburn or pass for me. I could see passing in a lot of spots because of the pace of Yale. They're just going to try to slow this down and muck it up, but don't really see them providing a test to Auburn. I'll likely pass on this game, but that's exactly it. Auburn or pass. Next up, game I do like. Colorado takes on Florida. This game, a lot more interesting. This Colorado team is awesome. We saw them in the play-in game against Boise. A little bit of a greasy game, but they win by seven points. They have the better analytical profile overall than Florida. They battled some health issues. Had a couple missed games. De Silva missed time. Cody Williams missed a bunch of time. And then a couple games here and there some, for some other players. Offense is very close. Florida holds the edge 18 at 25. Defense, not all that close. Colorado 39, Florida 69. Florida lost one of their bigs in Micah Hanlockton. Big loss for them, especially facing Colorado, who plays a really tall lineup. This team is 33rd in effective height. That's going to match up excellent against Florida, who's fourth. And again, probably not fourth anymore with Micah Hanlockton out with the broken leg. And even though there is a little bit of a gap in height, Colorado still has a rebounding edge. Shooting, not even close. Colorado 18, Florida 105. Interior, Colorado 56, 52nd in scoring, Florida 106. Three-point percentage, Colorado 4th, Florida 143. Even some of the defensive numbers, both teams outside the top 100 on the interior. And then Colorado actually has an edge defending the three, 68 to 82. So, I mean, this kind of sets up pretty well for Colorado in this spot. I have no issues with them, plus the two in this. I'll happily take them against the Gators in this game. Next up, Texas A&M takes on Nebraska. Really fun game. Those of you that have watched me for any length of time know that I am no Texas A&M fan. Don't think they should be in the tournament at 20 and 14. They have a bunch of egregious losses. A couple really good wins, though. And that's the story of Texas A&M throughout the year. Largely, they come down to their streaky shooting. This team is the third worst team in the entire field ineffective field goal percentage. They're 349. They're on par with the likes of teams like Wagner. This team flat out can't shoot. 301 in effective or 301 in interior scoring, 353 in three point percentage. They're a bottom 10 team shooting threes. If they run into one of these games where Wade Taylor and Tyrese Radford get lucky enough to hit their threes, they're live. Most of the time they're not. And even in these cases, you need to hit offensive rebounds. Luckily they're really good at that. They're first in the country offensive rebounds also leads to a really high foul rate because you need multiple things to go right. If you're a team that plays like this, you're likely missing your shot because Texas AM misses most of them. Then you need to grab the board. Then you need to put it back without fouling. A lot of things need to go right for Texas AM to win games. And this is all without even considering their opponent, Nebraska, who's ahead of them. Offense, defense, rebounding's close. They don't prioritize the glass as much on the offensive end as Texas A&M, but they are taller, 139 to 243, so they match up well against these players. And then really everything, shooting, they're almost 300 spots ahead, almost 300 spots ahead on the interior. From three, it's the same case. And they're actually better on defense in both those areas too. Interior, they're 14th in defense, Texas A&M, 137. Perimeter, 60, Texas A&M, 172. I'm not really finding a lot of advantages here for Texas A&M, and this is a hyper short spread, and I actually like the composition of this Nebraska roster. Good interior with Mast and Gary. Good three-point shooting with Tominaga. I know Texas A&M is pretty decent defending that area of the floor, but we'll still back Nebraska just far and away the better analytical team. 
Really, the only thing you can say is they've struggled away from home. Next up, Vermont takes on Duke. Vermont's injured. Tough to really talk about this team. Verretto's missed time. He's not the only one. They're practicing ahead of these games. Of course, they are. It's the NCAA tournament. How healthy are they? They see just massive efficiency everywhere. Uh, it's not even close. Somewhat close on defense, but Vermont's also played it. Uh, like an absolute cupcake of a schedule for the most part. We'll just go through the body of work for this Vermont team. So far, their best wins, Liberty, Bradley, Colgate, who's in the field, Virginia Tech, Miami, Ohio, those are their losses. So not great right away. Their best wins, Charleston at 99, Yale at 86. Then it's probably Toledo at 139. So you can see the body of work just very incomplete. Duke, conversely, plays a very rigorous non-conference before getting to the ACC. And Duke also has an awesome analytical profile, one that actually checks a lot of boxes and can win a tournament. As far as some of the in-depth stats, Vermont is 301 in height. Duke is 10th. Filipkowski, Mitchell, they're going to absolutely have a field day. Rebounding is not even close. 150 spots difference in favor of Duke. Interior scoring, not even close. Filipkowski, Mitchell, going to have an absolute field day. And if that doesn't happen, Duke's also 13th in the country at shooting threes. I'm certainly willing to lay the points, also willing to look at alt lines. The only thing that leaves me a little hesitant is Vermont's snail's pace, 350th. They'll try to slow it down. Doubt they have success. Next up, another throwaway game. Grambling takes on Purdue. Just no real takes here. Name your spread or name your score Purdue's way. I don't think they have any trouble whatsoever. Popular narrative will probably be, all right, Purdue loses these games sometimes. Given last year, they're 26 and a half point favorite. If they want to, they win this game. Grambling barely got past Montana State. Honestly, they were lucky to do that. Team is 306th in scoring. I mean, they don't play with much size. 160th, massive rebounding gap. What is there to say? Lay the money with Purdue if you want. I'll likely just pass on these name your score games without trying to guess the motivation of Purdue. They're also dealing with injuries. Braden Smith's been banged up, so is Edie. I don't know. All right, we get to Charleston taking on Alabama. This is a game that I think has some interest on the underdog side, but we'll talk about that in a second. This game, you basically have a poor man's Alabama on Charleston. So, I mean, they're pretty good offensively, 53, Alabama's third. Both teams are awful on defense. Alabama, it shows up more because they play at a higher level of competition, 118th. Charleston is 179th on defense. These teams are both fast, and then they're both reliant on shooting. But they both are pretty sizable in terms of their height. Alabama's 8th, Charleston's 56th. As far as shooting goes, Bama's 11th in the country in effective field goal. Charleston's 84th. Three-point percentage, it's 33 to 129. Interior scoring, Bama's 9th, Charleston's 86th. So just like there's a poor man's version of Charleston on the other side in almost every single statistical category. The reason I think they're somewhat live here is because you can pick off some pretty stale numbers with Charleston. I'll bring you to Odd Shopper in a second to prove that. But this team kind of matches up well overall against this Bama team. When you look at their body of work, it's not the best. Of course, you're you're playing at a conference that doesn't exactly test you all that often. They're in the Colonial. Their losses, they lost to Duquesne by 18. They're in the field. Lost to Vermont. That's not great. Lost to Wyoming. Big loss to FAU. Their wins are against Liberty, Hofstra, and it's not pretty from there. But the one thing I like about this team is they do play fast. So if Bama gets up to a lead and then they can take their foot off the gas a little bit, Charleston's actually trying and playing fast. So they have opportunities to get back in the game just because of the way they play. I don't love this game. I'm not likely to take it, but there is one angle you can play. And I'll show you the odd shopper right now where they do have a potential number. I think you should take if you have the legal means to in your state. So bringing you to the live odds screen right now, what you're going to see at the top, it's basically a line shopping tool called Live Odds. You can sort by your state. You can sort by books. What it does is tell you the best place to take these lines. So right now, DraftKings is actually hanging a stale 10 with Charleston, which I would happily take if it was available. But this tool is highly customizable and now has ROI tools, which show you the best Plus EV bets, we're talking size and total, so not always plus EV, but props and stuff. Those are likely to show you some positive ROI. And our Discord's now included. 
That's me, Ben, all our experts talking about these tools, giving you what we're ta what we're taking, why, how we're using the tools. It's interactive, so you can ask questions. But that's all available for one week, fourteen ninety five. One month, forty nine ninety five. No long term commitments. Try it out. It's the best time of year with a ton of sports betting going on, and we've had a lot of success in the community. The link is below, so check that out. It's been a lot of fun and really profitable so far. So to sum all this up, official pick will be Charleston. Do I feel good about it? Absolutely not. And am I likely to take it on my own? The answer is still probably no. All right, let's move to our next game. It's another throwaway. We have Longwood taken on Houston. I mean, Houston's hurt. They've lost all their depth. You Right now, Toggler's out. Arsenal's been out for a while. Walker's been out. And you have Roberts banged up. How much is Houston trying in this game, especially late? Truthfully, I have no idea. They're 23 and a half point favorites. They're taking money. Game is so slow. So, I mean, Houston names their score if they want to. Just like how willing are they to do this? And like, at what point do we see walk-ons because they don't have any depth? I don't know. As far as Longwood goes, they won the Big South. They were the fifth seed there. Just really disappointing. We saw Longwood and not High Point or Asheville. High Point's 113 in the country. Longwood's 157. So, I mean, just disappointing here. Maybe High Point could have won a game in this tournament, but Longwood's basically stone dead. Their analytical profile is just downright horrendous. As far as them against Houston, you're facing the number one defense in the country. Longwood is 202 in scoring, 168 in defense themselves. They're also not tall, nor is Houston, but like Houston just rebounds the hell out of the ball. You're playing undersized against them. Like, good luck, man. That's where we sit with Longwood. It's just a straight up pass for me, unless you think Houston names their score which maybe they do, but we're not betting narratives. We're betting data. Next up, James Madison takes on Wisconsin. Fun game here. Thinks James, think James Madison's pretty overrated in this spot after winning all those games. And I mean, I don't want to take anything away from James Madison or McNeese. These teams had impressive seasons, but James Madison's best win came in their opener. That was against Michigan State, went into overtime. Their next best win is against Akron, who's 119th in the country. From there, Southern Illinois, 122, Arkansas State, 132. Their losses, two to App State, who should be the representative from this conference, and then they lost to Southern Miss. So what does James Madison do? How do they match up against Wisconsin, who's perhaps the streakiest team in the field? James Madison seeding both offense and defense. Wisconsin, 15th on offense, 43rd on defense. Far taller team. They're 12th in height. James Madison is 220. Interior scoring, James Madison's outside the top 100 there. And for what it's worth, Mad Madison's also really bad on defense. This is the Badgers I'm talking about now. 155 in interior defense, 346 from three. They just force a lot of turnovers, and they play pretty sound basketball on the glass. They've also been playing really well lately, and they've gotten healthier. Walls back. Chucky's back and Blackwell's back, who's shooting about 45% from three. Just so many scores for this Wisconsin team who's actually played competition this year. Unlike James Madison, who has one top 100 win, and it's against Michigan State. And the only other two times they played top 100 teams, it was App State both times they lost them both. Badgers minus five and a half is honestly just a sharp value. I can't believe the line is this low. It just comes down to that 3-0 number in the front of the James Madison win-loss record. TCU takes on Utah State. This is a game I think that's a kind of a stylistic nightmare for this TCU team. They're favored. Utah State is catching four and a half. But, I mean, Utah State, champions of the Mountain West regular season. TCU plays in the Big 12, so just an, an awesome conference overall. But you look at these two teams, height is neutral. Utah State's 100, TCU's 99th, but Utah State excels where TCU's just horrible. So on offense, Utah State's 11th at interior scoring, TCU's 203 defending that area of the floor. Conversely, TCU does not score inside, they shoot threes, 84th and three-point percentage. Utah State's third in the country defending the perimeter. Rebounding's neutral. So like all these micro edges point Utah State's direction, and they're catching four and a half points. I actually like this TCU team a lot. I think the body of work is a little better. Emphasis on a little. Utah State played the 87th ranked strength of schedule. TCU was 46, so it's close there. 
But man, just like the micro wedges TC or Utah State's direction, don't make a lot of sense to me given this line. So we'll back them with a four and a half. To close this out, Grand Canyon takes on St. Mary's game with another tight spread. You're going to find St. Mary's minus a five and a half. Like Grand Canyon here, and my real reasoning is just level of competition stuff. St. Mary's is a team that at one point was not considered tournament viable, largely because they went on a massive losing streak in non-con. They lost five of six, six games to Weber State, San Diego State, Xavier, Utah, and Boise State. Only one in that stretch came against Davidson, but they also have a bunch of really good wins. Beat New Mexico in the second game, beat Colorado State, UNLV. Those are pretty solid but it did require a 15-game win streak during conference play in order to reach these heights. Then they dropped Gonzaga. They dropped to Gonzaga in their season finale before catching them again in the conference tournament to win the West Coast Conference. But ultimately, I have a lot of questions with the body of work, losing to teams like Weber State, Xavier. I mean, they got blown out by San Diego State, 15 points. And they've also lost players. Jefferson's not playing for this team anymore. On the other side, Grand Canyon, this team is shockingly tested for being a team that plays in the Western Athletic Conference. They beat San Francisco as an NIT team, lost close game to South Carolina, beat San Diego State, beat Louisiana Tech, who was the best player in that conference, and then they dropped a couple games in conference play, but really tight opponents. Overall, the body of work is better for Grand Canyon than one might think. They have an absolute alpha and tie on Grant Foster, who's 6'7". And they actually complement it with pretty good shooting. Gabe McLaughlin shooting 41% from three. The lineup for Grand Canyon, it's actually fairly tall, 134. So you need that when you're facing St. Mary's, who's the number one rebounding team in the country. Grand Canyon's 33rd. This isn't my favorite spread, but if you're sprinkling dogs, I think Grand Canyon is live here. I'm a little worried about the pace of St. Mary's. They can muck up a lot of things with their 358th ranked pace. But I still think this is worth sprinkling on Grand Canyon side of things to close it out. All right, that'll do it for us today. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them below. If you have any questions, reach out to me on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. Otherwise, we'll be back this weekend for the round of 32. And until then, good luck. We'll see you guys later.